Anyways, folks, grab your socks and hide the clocks. It's time for Event or Else, the podcast where I go through most every major Marvel and DC event, one issue at a time, so you don't have to. I'm your host, my name is Steven, and we kick off this new podcast with the event that started it all. Marvel Superheroes Secret Wars, issue number one, War Begins. This issue was published by Marvel Comics in May of 1984, and it was written by Jim Shooter, with pencils by Mike Zeck, inks by John Beatty, letters by Joe Rosen, and colors by Christy Scheel. Our story opens in the vastness of space, in a galaxy not our own, a galaxy never before seen by human eyes. Suddenly, among the stars, a structure appears, a construct of alien origin, and inside, a passel of the Earth's mightiest heroes, each just as confused and surprised as the other. We have from the Avengers, the Wasp, She-Hulk, Captain Marvel, Captain America, Thor, Hawkeye, and Iron Man. Representing the X-Men are Professor X, Storm, Nightcrawler, Rogue, Cyclops, Wolverine, Colossus, and Lockheed the Dragon. Playing as independents, we have the Hulk and our friendly neighborhood Spider-Man. And rounding out this all-star roster, three of the Fantastic Four, Reed Richards or Mr. Fantastic, The Thing, and The Human Torch. It's only as the introductions come to an end that our heroes realize they're not alone in this strange celestial wasteland. Another construct, similar to their own, drifts along beside them. This one, however, is chock full of evil. On board is the Enchantress, Ultron, the Absorbing Man, the Wrecker and his Wrecking Crew, Thunderball, Pile Driver, and Bulldozer. We have Kang the Conqueror, the Lizard, Dr. Octopus, the Molecule Man, Dr. Doom, and towering over all of them, Galactus, the World Devourer. But there's one person we forgot. So we's got a who's who of bad guys over here, huh? Says the thing. Well, then what's this slime ball Magneto doing here? Good question, the thing. Magneto, after all, is a world-renowned bad guy. He only heads up an organization called the Brotherhood of Evil Mutants. So why is he with the heroes and not with the villains? When questioned, Magneto, who's a totally superior guy, rebuffs the heroes and proclaims his innocence, using the argument that he was only fighting in defense of his race, homo superior. It's as Professor X is telling Magneto to slow his roll that all the stars but one disappear. Swept away, says Thor, like dust before some unseen giant hand. Suddenly, the constructs begin to move, hurtling at fantastic speed toward the lone star, which, I should probably clarify, is not Texas. And before their very eyes, a planet is formed. While Doom finds the sight awe-inspiring and humbling, the other villains do as villains do. They fight amongst themselves. It's not long after the fighting begins that the mad robot Ultron goes on a kill-crazy rampage, and Doom convinces Owen Reese, the Molecule Man and Resonant Wiener, to use his power over molecules to lift Ultron and float him into Galactus's field of view. Ultron, being the mad robot he is, fires on Galactus, thinking that the giant is the reason he's suddenly defying gravity, and he even goes as far as proclaiming that he's gonna slay Galactus slowly for the indignity. Galactus, however, merely raises a hand, and with the slightest of gestures, possibly even a eh, douses the robot's power plant before going back to gazing into the void as Ultron falls lifelessly to the floor. Then suddenly a rift opens in space, bathing the two groups in a light brighter than the sun, which is pretty weird, right? But not weird enough, because from the rift comes a voice. I am from beyond, it says. Slay your enemies and all you desire shall be yours. Nothing you dream of is impossible for me to accomplish. And with those three sentences, we have the entire premise of our story. While both the heroes and villains are busy standing around in slack-jawed amazement, Galactus goes after he who is from beyond, or as Galactus calls him, the Beyonder. Galactus is the world devourer, meaning he literally eats planets, and he can sense that the Beyonder is powerful enough to take away the giant's insatiable hunger. And so Galactus flies from the structure to force the Beyonder to do just that. 
Doctor Doom follows Galactus, hoping to gain some sort of advantage. Instead, all he gets is a ringside seat to the Beyonder, whooping Galactus's big old purple butt, and manages to get caught up in that as well. The Beyonder warns Galactus not to proceed. Galactus ignores him. There's a big light show, and then bang! Both Galactus and Doom fall to the planet's surface, swatted back like flies. The constructs begin moving again, each going their separate ways, as our heroes suddenly find themselves beamed planet side. Captain America immediately takes charge, because, well, that's what he does. Be ready for anything. Form a circle. I've got the 12 o'clock position. I want an Avenger at 2, 4, 6, 8, and 10 with eyes peeled. Move! Iron Man, keep your radar working. Wolverine, being a cantankerous malcontent, has thoughts about Cap taking charge. Good at giving orders, ain't he? Yes, he is, says the Hulk, who at this time in Marvel history has Bruce Banner's brain. Maybe the best. That's right. The Hulk knows which side of the bread is buttered. Our heroes argue over Magneto once again, nearly coming to blows. The X-Men and Magneto on one side, everybody else on the other. But before it gets too real, Magneto takes his ball and goes home. Metaphorically, that is. I mean, they're, they're on another planet. And so with the Magneto problem out of the way, next on their checklist is deciding which one of them is going to lead their group. Mr. Fantastic and the Hulk decline, and the Wasp suggests Captain America because, well, he's Captain Flippin' America, that's why. Wolverine, who seems to have a problem with that as well, makes his disapproval known. But once Thor vouches for Cap, Ain't nothing left to be said. Meanwhile, elsewhere on our patchwork planet, Doom wakes next to a prone Galactus who is still out cold, but alive. With little left to do but walk away, Doom does so, and just like that, spies a fortress in the distance. There is no doubt in Doom's mind that not only was said fortress put there by the Beyonder, but that he's also going to find the other villains there. And so he sets out at once, and sure enough, he arrives to find his fellow evildoers. The Wrecker announces that they've all talked, and with but a few exceptions, they all agree that Doctor Doom should lead them, that with him in charge, they will surely gain the prize that the Beyonder promised them. Doom tries to explain to the villains that there's more to all this than the prize, when he's suddenly interrupted by the Molecule Man. You mean we aren't going to fight for the answer to all our dreams? I want a nice house and a yard and lots of friends and maybe even a girl, one who likes me and ow! Doom slaps him aside. Ignore your petty dreams. To fight is to prove we are but microbes on a slide. We must transcend ourselves. In other words, Doom wants to use his companions to help him steal the Beyonder's power and become a god. The others, however, think Doom has just suddenly decided to be some kind of wimp, and they start to push back. Doom, logically, shoots him down with the power bolts from his gauntlets, buries them under a few tons of machinery, and leaves. Or at least he tries to. He finds some kind of space airplane and takes off, only to be shot out of the sky by Kang using this big old giant laser cannon. The heroes see the ship being shot from the sky and immediately mobilize to check it out, which gives us probably the single greatest panel in this entire book. Because not all of the superheroes can fly, so some of them need assistance. The X-Men, for example, Rogue can fly, but other than Storm, the rest of them can't. Storm can manipulate the weather and she can push herself along using the wind. That's how she flies. And so she does the same for Colossus, Professor X, Cyclops, Wolverine, and Nightcrawler. Captain Marvel can fly, the Human Torch can fly, Thor can fly, and Iron Man can fly. And Iron Man is holding a large slab of rock. And on top of that slab of rock is She-Hulk, Hawkeye, and Captain America. Reed Richards is just stretching alongside them. Apparently he can stretch so far and so fast that he can catch up with everybody who's flying. And then the Hulk, who doesn't fly but can leap for miles, is carrying the thing. And then he's got Spider-Man following along behind. Spider-Man is basically holding on to a web line that is attached to the Hulk's back, and Spider-Man's just simply saying, "Wee!" When they arrive, they find out that it is, of course, Doctor Doom. And amazingly, he's alive, thanks to his personal force field. Doom, it seems, 
left the villains to find Reed Richards, or Mr. Fantastic. Figuring he's the only one with intellect near dooms and might have the capacity to understand what they're all up against. Captain America, despite warnings from his companions, races to Doom's side to offer his aid. Doom being Doom is offended by the gesture, thinking that Cap and the others pity him. Well, Doom ain't having any of that, and so he fires at them, blasting many of them off their feet and flies away. The heroes pick themselves up, dust themselves off, and have barely a moment to catch their collective breath when the rest of the villains attack in what is most definitely the cliffhanger ending to this issue. And with our story now told, it's time for the top three things to dwell on. The top three things to dwell on are three moments in the book that I feel need to be given just a bit more thought. They might be funny moments. They might be stupid moments. They could even be moments of serious drama that make me feel a little something in my heart. Regardless, their moments, I think, are worth the time to revisit. Thing to dwell on number three, the introductions. So the moment in the issue where the heroes introduce themselves to each other is just it's just a great big bunch of stupid fun. I mean, by this point, they should all know each other, right? So what's the point of this scene? Other than, of course, introducing the characters to the reader in a very ham-fisted sort of way. But let's pretend for a moment that they don't know each other at all. Reading through the intros is still pretty silly and pretty fun. The Wasp starts us off. Everybody knows us. We're the Mighty Avengers and we're famous. But just in case, I'm the Wasp. And with me are She-Hulk, Captain America, Thor, Hawkeye, and Iron Man, who's really on leave, but is with us anyway. I find that last part curious for some reason. I mean, do we really need to know that Iron Man's on leave? I, we don't, not really. It's a pointless bit of information and I'm really not sure why it's there. But we continue with Professor X introducing his team. The Hulk and Spider-Man each introduce themselves. And then Ben Grimm, the thing, takes over in what I think is one of the funniest moments of this issue. We're the Fantastic Four, minus Susie, the invisible girl, to you. Stretcho calls himself Mr. Fantastic, if you can believe that. This crumbs the human torch, and I'm the Easter Bunny. Which is, I guess, Ben's way of saying they already know who he is. There's no reason to tell them he's the thing. They know he's the thing. Which really means, again, they all know who they are. And since the Wasp pretty much told us the same thing up front, I feel like this is just Jim Shooter telling us, yeah, we all know this is stupid, but I did it anyway. Thing to dwell on number two, Johnny Storm is a jerk. Now, I've never been a big fan of Johnny Storm, the Human Torch. I don't know if this is still a thing, but back when this book was published, Marvel often enjoyed having Johnny pick on Ben, if for no other reason than that he didn't look human. And in many cases, because of his monstrous exterior, to Johnny often meant the thing had a feeble brain. There are two examples of this kind of thinking with Johnny in this book. The first is when the heroes suddenly find themselves on the alien construct in space. Reed Richards gives his theory on how they were all transported from Earth to their current situation, and Reed Richards being who he is, he uses a lot of big words. When Iron Man doesn't quite understand what Reed is trying to say, Johnny announces, just hang out, Iron Man. Reed will get tired of talking in $5 words in a minute, and then he'll explain in English. Then he'll explain it again to the thing in one-syllable words. I, for one, have never found it funny when blonde-haired, blue-eyed, good-looking, popular, idol of millions Johnny Storm poked fun at the thing for being what Johnny considered a dumb, ugly freak. It just always seemed more than a little cruel to me. But he really shows his colors later in the book when Reed suggests that Bruce Banner, the Hulk, lead their group. The Hulk, Johnny exclaims in shock, hey, no offense, Doc, but it wasn't so long ago that you were a dumb monster, and it's tough to shake that mental image. Johnny Storm, ladies and gentlemen, world-class jerk. Thing to dwell on number one, Wolverine and his claws. Reading this issue, it dawned on me at one point that in every single panel Wolverine appears in, his claws are out, which just seems incredibly silly to me. I mean, if you don't show him popping his claws every now and again at any point in the issue, 
a new reader is just going to assume that this guy just has these claws permanently attached to the backs of his hands. And frankly, kind of makes you wonder how he might pick his nose. And those were the top three things to dwell on. So now we come to that time in the show where I wrap it all up and tell you how I feel about the book in general. It was a lot of fun. This is not a book that requires a lot of deep thought. The purpose of this book was to sell toys, and it was just to throw a fun little adventure out there for kids to read and give them a reason to play with the toys. As long as you go into the book knowing that and not expecting a lot, you're going to enjoy the crap out of this book. The art is beautiful. Mike Zeck is one of those guys that I have been following for a long time and love reading anything that Mike Zeck provides the art on. There were a couple of things in this book that if you didn't know it at the time, you may not notice it. For example, when the heroes are all brought aboard the construct, Professor X is sitting in his wheelchair. Well, at the time, in the X-Men, his legs worked. He didn't need to be in the, in the wheelchair anymore. And I know they try to explain that in a later issue, but it just kind of goes to show that Mike Zeck at this point probably didn't know exactly what was going on in some of the other books. And whoever was editing this book either just didn't catch it or didn't feel like pointing it out. Maybe they were on a schedule and they didn't have time to, to go back and fix it. Ah, well, we'll, we'll explain it in another book. Don't worry about it, guys. Let's just get going. But all in all, this was fun. I read it the first time when I was a kid and I feel like a kid whenever I read it again. And we've got 11 more issues to go. So join us back here next time as we attempt to answer the question, is She-Hulk a valley girl? That's coming at you next week in episode number two, Prisoners of War. Be there or may the force be with you. Wait, I got the wrong page here.